Coming up on Windows Weekly, Leo is out, but I, Micah Sargent, am filling in. And of course, we've got Mary Jo Foley and Paul Therott to talk about Windows. Up first, Mary Jo has a bit of an anecdote about a PC she may have had to purchase because hers was giving her trouble. And you know what? It's not easy to migrate to a new system. So we talk a little bit about that migration process. There's also a lot going on with Microsoft 365 right now, including some really good deals. And Bill Gates looks back, of course, at his time uh, at Microsoft, but has recently written a blog post sort of following up on that and plans for a new book as well. Paul Therott has his Xbox Corner, but this time I kind of join in on the fun and we talk a little bit about gaming and streaming and round things out with the tips and picks of the week and a special drink that you'll just have to watch Windows Weekly if you want to hear more about that. Windows Weekly is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Securing every access point in your company doesn't have to be a challenge. LastPass unifies access and authentication to make securing your employees simple and well, secure, even when they're working remotely. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly, episode 700, recorded Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. Have you met a goose? This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Thinkst Canary. Detect attackers on your network while avoiding irritating false alarms. Get the alerts that matter. For 10% off and a 60-day money-back guarantee, go to canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the How Did You Hear About Us box. And by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? To uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash windows. And by Bandwidth. Bandwidth understands the challenge enterprises face when migrating to direct routing for Microsoft Teams. That's why Bandwidth launched Duet for Microsoft Teams, the only complete solution for direct routing and Microsoft certified E911, available direct from a carrier, designed to simplify your team's migration. Request your proof of concept at bandwidth.com slash WW. Hello, I am Micah Sargent, subbing in for Leo Laporte today on Windows Weekly. Yes, he is on vacation, but I am happy to be here to talk to some of the foremost Windows watchers in the world. It is Paul Therott of Therott.com. Hello, Paul. Hello. And Mary <laughs> Jo Foley of All About Microsoft. Hello, Mary Jo. Hi, Micah. How are you? I am doing you know, as well as can be expected, <laughs> certainly, um, and excited, as I always say, to talk Windows with you today. Good, good. Uh, I got a great show planned, it looks like, and uh, congratulations to you both on your 700th episode. I know, right. that's crazy, right? right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, what you start to do the math on that and somebody could spend the next, I don't even know how many days just listening right. to Windows I Weekly. Mean, it it over. barely feels like 600 episodes, you know. <laughs> Where I've only been here for from? some of them. I, I don't even, I was going to look up what number I came on and I always forget to do that, but yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I mean, it was, uh, only... I mean, it was over 10 years ago. Uh, was it really? 10 years ago. Well, I think so because we have notes in our note thing going back to 2011. Oh, okay. And yeah. you, oh, 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 oh. So you that joined was... in 2011. Wow. Oh, so you're Actually, the so we, one we probably note. could find it out. So the, the last show huh? of 2011, we did a best and worst of 2011, and yeah, one it was so sometime that year. So I guess that's about what nine? Okay. Nine years. Wow. 2011 was the year I graduated from something. I won't say what, though. <laughs> Elementary school, we know. <laughs> you got me there. Uh, no. Um, so so I'm, I'm curious then, you know, going into the 700th episode, um, are we looking at a, a bit of a retrospective episode here? Or are we just uh, carrying on as if things are just a regular episode? <laughs> Uh, no, I would say full speed ahead at this point. Um, yeah, we usually yeah. do a ret you know we do the annual retrospectives, uh, and by we I mean you, because <laughs> <laughs> Mary Joe and I have nothing to do with it. But um, 
you know, every year, obviously. So no, I mean, we usually do like a, a an end of year retrospective. We have Chris Capicella on, so we will be doing that, right? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. In December sometime. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So yeah, no, today is just a retrospective that. of Thanksgiving's past. <laughs> the ghost of Thanksgiving past, present, and in the future. Um, I, I guess it starts out with speaking, you know, Mary Jo, you were talking about having a little, uh, some, some issues, some technical difficulties, which could mean possibly that you're in the market for a PC. So are you single-handedly going to save the PC yes, market? Yes, exactly. I heard PC's going to rebound thanks to yeah, Mary Jo. Yeah, thanks to Mary Jo. Oh, Tell me more about this. What's going on? So last night I had a little problem with my Surface Laptop 3, which has been great for the past year that I've had it. And it just suddenly stopped working out of the blue um, last night. So this morning I made a frantic trip to Best Buy because, believe it or not, I didn't have a single extra PC in my apartment. Usually I have a few, but I had been giving them all back and giving them away. And so... I didn't even have one. I had none. So I had to go down to Best Buy to try to buy a PC. And you know what? All these things we're hearing about PC shortages because of the pandemic and working from home, they are all true. (laughs) (laughs) It was super hard to find a PC that I wanted. And um, I ended up getting one that isn't exactly what I want, but it's working for today. So I got got an HP Spectre. Um, which I like. I like the HP brand and the Spectres, but mm-hmm. it's a 15 inch, which is a little yeah. big and a little heavy for my needs. <laughs> is this the X360? Does it have like the cropped back corners? Yeah. You know, where, yeah. yeah. That's, oh, yeah. yeah. I'm looking at it now. Um, yeah. It's actually a nice computer, um, but it's, yeah, it yeah. is big, obviously. It's big, it's heavy. And you know what? Finding the power button took me like 25 minutes. I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh, is it on one of those corners? I think it's on the back corner, right? It is. It's like hidden yeah. on one of these slanted corners. Yeah. And you look at the instructions that come with it to, and says, press the power button. But it doesn't show you where oh, the power button point. is. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, not to, so not to be the HP spokesman, but to, if I could defend the company. By, yes. by chopping off those corners, they uh, are able to use that space where they wouldn't otherwise. And it angles the the other uh, the other one. So one side's yeah. a power button. The other one is the power adapter, like the USB yeah. mm-hmm. C yeah. connector. So it angles it off of the machine at like a 45 degree angle. Yeah. So if you're going to use a mouse over there, it doesn't get in the way. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, some of the animations now to see. So <laughs> I, I, this is interesting because it is one of those sort of convertible machines. This one is yeah. m- more akin to some sort of, um, I don't know, Lamborghini vehicle in its <laughs> um, interesting yeah. edges and, and grills and everything like that. But yeah. it is very yeah. angular. Yeah. Uh, is, is. is that the... Is that the trend of PCs in general? No, the sort that's of the trend area? with HP. No, oh, it's yeah. just this HP. is an HP design language thing. They're they're doing it to their commercial PCs now as well. It started with the X360. Yeah, uh, it's a, a really beautiful PC, right? Yeah. It's really lovely. Like if you looked at it, you're like, wow. But it's just a little heavier and bulkier than I wanted. But you know what I couldn't find when I was shopping is I wanted a PC with 16 gigs. Uh, sorry, 16 megs. Of RAM. Gigs. 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 I've had a long week. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the, the iceberg. Um, <laughs> and and so I couldn't find that. Like they all had eight. Um, yeah. And then they all had one terabyte of storage. And I'm like, I don't need a terabyte Weird. of storage on the PC, right? Because right. I save so everything the, in the cloud. So Right. The PC that you bought, is it eight gigs or 16? It's 16 with 256 storage. So yeah. that's uh, those are good specs, and it's a Core i7, um, which is what I was looking for. And it was on sale, too. It was the last nice. one they had in the store. If you don't mind me I asking, had to, like, how much, much was it? I think it was um, $1,100. Um, oh, that's great. That's actually a good price for that. Yeah, it was a good price. But I had to rush down to the store, take a lift, rush down to the store, because it was the last one, and they're like, you better come get it, because... <laughs> Somebody's not going to be here today. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So So I'm like, wow. (laughs) This is interesting then because you, uh, you've included a link, Paul, you wrote this article, Mm -hmm. uh, PC revenue was flat in the previous quarter. Um, so does uh, the previous quarter that accounts for, uh, this rush in pandemic stuff in pandemic purchases? Oh, this is HP specifically. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry. So HP, uh, most uh, companies announced their quarterly earnings about a month ago. Uh, so I was a little curious why HP did this now. Their uh, quarter is skewed a month. So it's uh, instead of ending at the end of September, it ended at the end of October. And also it was the end of their fiscal year because, of, you know, who knows? So, <laughs> but yeah, um, overall uh, PC sales for them were flat. Revenues were down. And I think that probably says something about the types of PCs uh, that mm -hmm. people have been buying lately. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think the first two quarters of the pandemic, we saw the big gains uh, for PCs especially and premium PCs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this past quarter, it seems like other PC makers were saying it was mostly lower end computers for back to school, Chromebooks, things like that. Mm -hmm. Although um, HP did point out that their uh, notebooks are up 25% uh, units, unit wise, uh, desktops down. 31%, but what they call the consumer premium PC, which by the way is exactly what Mary Jo bought, that's the Spectre XC60 is at the top of that range of uh, HP computers. Uh, so our, their, the demand for that type of computer grew up by 29% uh, in the most recent quarter. So now 30% thanks to Mary Jo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to help itself. out, you know? Yeah, Every, yeah any, anything we can do to help. Buy iPhones, uh, computers, whatever you can do. <laughs> exactly. Um, now, Mary Jo, one of the things that you talked about is setting up a new PC. And, you know, obviously... I think regardless of what system you're using, what machine you're using, yeah. uh, that is a bit of an issue. Um, so what what was the process here of trying to set up a new PC, especially given that, you know, you, it, you came in, it wasn't working <laughs> and yeah. you had to get it fixed and going? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I always feel like this about Microsoft, which is they give you so many choices. It's not an issue of they don't let you have choice but they let you have too many choices, right? So I, you know, whenever I set up a PC, I just kind of scroll through the privacy settings, which I shouldn't, I don't really like scrutinize that, but click on yes to the agreement, click on the privacy settings, but then you get bombarded by all these possibilities. Do you want to sign in? Do you want to do this? Do you want to add this free subscription? You got this deal with Dropbox because, you know, of all the crapware that gets put on PCs. You get this deal with McAfee, this and this. Do you want this setting on or off? And I'm like, if you are a normal, regular PC user, this has got to look like a complete chaotic nightmare to you. It's yeah, not It's, it's not right. good. It's too much, you know? Yeah. So every it, it's interesting because basically every digital Apple's devices do this um, all of them you know they have these lengthy wizard based setup routines you answer questions mm -hmm. answer questions kind of step through do you want to do this do you mind yeah. setting additional blah, blah, blah. but you know it takes a long time to get through that stuff yeah the, the problem on the PC is that um, they don't even though we have sync through a Microsoft account there's no sense of here, here's the configuration I've decided I want. I apply it to this computer too. Yeah. There's really nothing like that that will trim down the setup time. You know, on a mm -mm. when you buy an iPhone or an Android phone, for example, one of the options that most people probably choose is like, yeah, just uh, you know, restore from a backup. Right. And the thing mm -hmm. comes up, it's exactly like it was, you know, on the phone you just had. Yeah. And you get, you get on with your life. It's nice. Um, yeah. I don't do that myself because I like to experience, you know, whatever's happening. But um, on Windows, we we don't have that. You know, even though there is some no. syncing of data, uh, of, of settings or whatever, very, very right. small amount of things syncs. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to go through and that all you, the time. And you Sorry. get this new screen now, which I had never seen, but I had read and written about, which says, how do you mostly use your PC? And then the options yeah. are all things that overlap, right? It's like, right. as a work machine, to do this, to look at photos, to do this. And I'm like... Well, about four out of the six things apply to me, so I guess I'll click all of them. And then it automatically, like, lodges certain thing into your taskbar. Oh, no. Uh -uh. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. okay. Yeah, what I, have I done? Give me the pro I, route, please. Can I? Is there a way yeah. I can just sort of I'm not kind of looking for questions. a minimalist kind of setup. Do you, is that yeah. an option? Yeah. yeah. I don't do anything uh, with the computer. Just give me a blank screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, uh, I saw all, the all these icons. <laughs> no, there are all these icons on the taskbar. I'm like, I don't even know what half of these icons are <laughs> that I am seeing there. <laughs> oh, man. I, that's interesting because, yeah, I wonder do if this is just a matter of, of them not 
quite getting to the place where it's easy to transition to a new computer or if the idea is that you may trade up your phone a lot more frequently than you do uh, a computer. And so up to this point, the thought was, you know, you'd want to set this up all as new. I'm, or am I, am I giving an so, excuse? Sounds like Paul saying I'm giving yeah, an excuse. Yeah, I appreciate you deserve. standing up for the software giant. But um, <laughs> I, th this, this notion of signing in with a Microsoft account and having settings sync between your PCs yeah. is over 12 years old. Um, no, right. that's not true. Uh, it is it's been there it's forever, eight, eight right? years old. So Windows uh, yeah. 2012, Windows 8, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem with it is there's a very small subset of settings that sync. Those things all occur after you've already signed in. So you have to go through all that setup process to get to that point. Yeah. Um, it doesn't change any of it. There is no way to go in and understand exactly what settings sync. Microsoft has never improved the list of settings that sync. Yeah. It's kind of arbitrary. Like, you know, you know, some stuff does, some stuff doesn't. Um, and yeah, like you said, I mean, yes, I mean, it is fair to say people probably do, or at least have to this point upgraded their phones more than they do their computers, but computers have been around for a long time. It seems like we That's could have true, adapted too. to this trend. Um, I know, I don't know. I it's, it is, it is one of the things that is, I, I, and again, not to get, not to be dark about it, but I feel like nobody really gives a crap, honestly, uh, I at Microsoft know. about this kind of thing, you know? It's and just not a high, uh, attractive, you know, no. I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate my career at Microsoft to making the uh, initial sign into windows better for everybody. And yes, you know, you know it's just not a, that, that would, would be a great make a difference. <laughs> it would, <sighs> it would make you feel like you had something cool, like a, like a premium device. Cause you, you know, you spent a thousand plus 2000 plus dollars on a really nice PC. And then you go through sure. that and it's like, First impressions. I don't know. You know, <laughs> like yeah, oh, it's, oh, um, well. the, the privacy screen that you were talking about where you have, yeah. um, I don't know, maybe six sliders or actually 12 sliders yeah. or whatever that you can determine. You can dive in and read about each one, you know. Right. Um, I, I've spent time looking at all that stuff and I, I, mm -hmm. I set up a lot of computers because I review computers. So I kind of, in my mind, it's streamlined a little bit to sort of like click, click, click. And I don't even really right. think about it. Yeah. Anymore, but, but, you know, people should look at that stuff and. Think yeah. about that stuff. And I would like there, for example, to be an option because I, I accept all of the Microsoft privacy defaults in that one case. That's one screen mm -hmm. where I'm like, yep, that's fine. Uh, I should never have to see that again unless something has changed. Right. You know, exactly. Um, I've signed into changed. my Microsoft account. You know, I've accepted this every time, single time. I've accepted mm -hmm. it several hundred times. Um, no, why? and then the reverse yeah. should be true because you know where I'm going to go with this now, right? When I set yeah. up my email, what's turned on <laughs> focused inbox, which I have turned off at least a thousand times, maybe more than a thousand. Yeah. And it forces it on your email like you get for, you like a trick you in the wording so that you can't even get around it. And then once you've enabled it, it's it's like, how do you get out of this? Right. And I'm like, OK, so you're syncing some settings, but then you're also syncing ones that I have never accepted and you're syncing them like I have because you're sure that I want conversation view and focused inbox, even though I don't, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, wait, why are they syncing that when I've never synced that? <laughs> there is um, uh, a real missed opportunity here to sync more settings and per app settings like the one you're talking about. Provide a dashboard in the web where you can go and reset mm -hmm. them all to their defaults if you just want to get out of it or, or individually see what the settings are. Um, you could go to the web or in this fantasy world I've created in my head where you might be able to go there and say in the future, you know, I'm going to, by unchecking this option, I'm going to change what happens in the future. So the next time I mm -hmm. sign in with my Microsoft account on a PC, now it will be different. You know, none of that exists. Um, no. and I, like I said, it's probably not, it's, I don't think it's anyone's priority. I, they, yeah. they can claim there are setting syncs and when it's, or there is setting sync in windows 10 because there is, but it's arbitrary and very limited. And it's never really changed. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, the one thing I was very happy that did sync were all my files were right where I left them in the cloud. <laughs> well, um, because wow. they were in the cloud, right? <laughs> no, but <laughs> so. it, like you have this moment of panic. Like when my machine died, I'm thinking, oh, man, do I have any files on there that I need that I didn't right. sync to the cloud? And I'm like, no, I don't. Okay, good. You know. <laughs> Right. Because that, that's great. Like I can just like set this PC up and then pull up Notepad and I can find all the files actually, that a, I want. 
That's a really good point because I think of it as kind of a, you know, a nicety. I mean, like I said, I review computers. So I, I yeah. go to a new computer tomorrow. I sign with my account, blah, blah, blah. I, I, my OneDrive's there, all my files are there. It's nice. Yep. But um, that's nice. I mean, it's great. I don't, it, I'm glad I have it. But it's more important for some, someone like you where you actually had a disaster. Right. You know? And look, look you, you didn't want to spend 1100 bucks on a computer today. But no. <laughs> the fact is, it didn't work. <laughs> you were able to do it. And when you brought that thing up, the stuff it was all there, you yeah. know. That's huge. It's it not is. like the old days. You lost a hard drive or something in the old days. That data was gone. It was it was over. Yeah, that's yeah. honestly the best part. And and two, one of the the benefits of that is not only does it uh, in many cases work from PC to PC, but oftentimes it also works between devices. And so that oh, could yeah. be, you yep. know, you you may have lost it in the moment, but you needed to get something done really quick. You could just pull it up on your phone and take sure. care of that really quick. Not yep. not typically my <clears throat> my cup of tea. I, I like working on my PC, but uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm often impressed with what some there. people can yeah, uh, achieve there. on their devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things you've got in here is all about uh, Google Chrome um, continuing its support on Windows 7 for those people who are yeah. just holding on for dear life to Windows 7. <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot it's of not so much. 2%. Yeah, it's probably not. No, people, it's big, right? right? Isn't it 25% or something <laughs> still running Windows 7? Oh, I don't I don't know. I think it's Actually, pretty big. Look. Yeah. Yeah. We should, okay, let's look at that. But um, yeah. certainly among business users, it's still pretty big. Right. And... Uh, and that's really what this is about. I mean, a lot of people, yeah, by the way, you're right, it is 25%. So um, a lot of people probably haven't noticed this, but there, there was a little pandemic this year. And a lot of stuff came grinding <laughs> to a halt. And among those yeah. things that came grinding to a halt was a lot of these migrations away from Windows 7. So uh, I think what Google has seen is that a lot of their corporate users, especially commercial, I should say commercial because it could be schools or government installations, whatever, we're still on Windows 7. And so rather than, I think they were going to end the support, what, probably in January at the end of this year, um, they extended it out by six months just to give these companies more time. Actually, I'm sorry. It's Now it's going until January 15, 2022. So originally it was going to expire in July 2021. Mm. It's good. That's is, fine. is Edge on the same schedule as Chrome? That's what I couldn't remember. I or, think I, Edge is on its I own schedule. So, right? Oh. Yeah. And... I think it's based on this schedule, but I think the, Microsoft is basically doing the same thing, you know, um, yeah. not, and I don't mean the same date. I mean, basically looking at where their customers are at and will um, mm -hmm. move accordingly. Actually, now that I said that, that's not really true, is it? Because Microsoft <laughs> has extended agreements for Windows 7 customers that go out years yeah. from now. So they right. will support three years from the date. Yep. Yes. Yep. For, in that in that case, actually, they will support it. Yep. I, I, I assume. Right. I hadn't considered how the pandemic kind of played a role in that. And that's because a lot of the times what the migrations require in-person work, or is it just that folks yeah, are hands on computers? Um, not that that stuff, you know, kind of can't happen depending on the company, but you know, the reality is I, I think, look, I mean, this is certainly a reality. We have more important things to worry about, <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. all of us. And yeah. so I think a lot of this work just kind of slowed down and, and I'm sure, you know, everyone intends for it to happen eventually, but, um, this is the right thing to do I don't, I, yeah. there's no, there's no, nothing to complain about here. So it's mm -hmm. good. Um, good for them. Yeah. yeah. So there, there've been some more insider builds, uh, but no new features. I, I remember last time I was on the show, uh, we had talked about some updates to Windows that didn't seem to bring any new features. And is that, uh, is that <laughs> yeah. still, relatively typical? Those. Um, yeah, it's a recurring theme lately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think since the last show, there have been two uh, preview builds, probably one for the current, whatever the current channel is called, um, what is the current channel? Fast or whatever they call it now. What do they call it now? They call it, so I can't even keep track of it. Fast. Dev channel is fast, fast and release preview and beta are the slow and yeah. release previewing. Yeah. Okay. So they've had, yeah, beta and release preview uh, updates and also fast. Um, but none yeah. of them are, none of them have any new For features. The interesting like 21H1. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what's interesting. So 20, 20 H2 is beta and pre release preview still for some yeah. reason. So yep. they're actually beta testing updates to the operating system that's shipping to the public. Yeah. Right. Right. So yeah. Oh, I know. This, love that. 
Yeah. So these bug fixes, they're testing bug fixes basically, right? So these bug fixes will occur for the public at some time in the future. Gotcha. But no new features. Yeah, so hopefully won't break anything else, but we'll fix the things that are already broken. That's not crazy. I, we're, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, too much to ask. You're right. No, I don't we know can only promise so much. I know. <laughs> no, and, and, and when they started doing, I couldn't remember if they had ever put um, bug fixes after a, after a release came out into release preview and beta channels. But if this is new-ish, I like it because it means they're adding another level of testing to a bunch of fixes and that's only good, so, right? right? Because so, <laughs> you're giving them way too much credit. I actually think okay. that this has something to do with the fact that they literally have not moved on to the next version of windows yet in the insider uh, program. Right. Right. And it, it, it I, I do believe you're right that it's unprecedented. Um, and, and I agree with you hundred percent. This is a good thing. I mean, it's, it's neat to have, insiders testing just what will be a cumulative update for the shipping version of Windows. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Um, but I, I, but it is weird, right? I mean, I think it is also unprecedented that is. they've not moved testing of any the of the rings or whatever yeah. channels or whatever they're calling them now to yeah. the next version. The next they're thing. literally not talking about it. No, they won't tell. So Micah, this is interesting and weird. They won't tell <laughs> us if there's going to be a 21 H1 feature update or if there is not they won't right. say it um because I there's did. been rumors there wouldn't be one then there have been rumors that there might be a small one instead of a major one and all they'll say is nothing has changed <sighs> nothing to see here la 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 <laughs> you know well, so. look away. Have about 90 minutes for the rest of the show and that's not enough time to explain to a normal person <laughs> how this is supposed to work how it usually works how it's changed over time and how it is today, because it's completely, I, I, you know, if you think about it, the Insider program is basically a beta test. And they have mm -hmm. different, they're calling them channels now that are testing different, what typically have been versions of Windows 10. That literally, there are three channels, none of them are testing the next, ver any next version of Windows 10, none of them are. <laughs> and it's those, very strange. Yeah, weren't those channels, and they used to be called rings? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I thought I remember that correctly. Yeah. Uh, well, I still have a hard time with the, the <laughs> you know, the words we're going to use to describe these things. But yeah, the fast ring, which is now what? The beta channel? No, dev channel? <laughs> dev, right? Same. Yeah. Is testing features that will be in, probably will be in some future version of Windows 10. But they're not, it, it literally is not tied to any particular version. And I believe won't be for the foreseeable future. Right. Hmm. Good, good. Slow and yeah. release preview. No. No, beta and release preview, sorry, <laughs> are, were testing 20H2, which was released already. Yes. Yep. They're still there testing away newer builds of a version of Windows 10 that's already shipping to the public. I guess that took less than 90 minutes. Just don't ask any questions. <laughs> yeah, I just, we'll just, what you've said is what I'll go with. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> It's um, really confusing, yeah. Incredibly confusing. Perhaps uh, less confusing, but certainly interesting, is uh, an, a rumor about Microsoft and Android. What's going on here? Yeah, yeah. so this, when, uh, Zach Bowden, this is a Zach Bowden from Windows Central rumor, and he's got a pretty good track record on rumors, I will say. So he's got a rumor saying he's hearing whispers that Microsoft might allow app vendors to put Android apps in the Microsoft store, which makes zero sense to me because, <laughs> <laughs> um, <All right. laughs> you know, my guess is what's happening is, you know, Microsoft has this program, the Europhone program, where they're letting you do more and more things that happen on your phone on your PC. So right now they're for some Samsung Galaxy users, you can even manage multiple Android apps simultaneously on your PC, like apps that are on your phone, on your PC. But do you need to take the next step and actually put those apps in the Microsoft Store? That just seems like a weird extra thing to add. Um, and I can't understand the reasoning why they would do that, especially because they're emphasizing Windows development now with Project Reunion, which is making it easier and cleaner for developers 
with 132 UWP, however you want to build an app, get all those apps in the store. So then why are you going to add Android apps to the store? Like this well, is just kind of weird, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, just for, from a historical or historic, historical, I don't know which. Yeah. Name. I know what you're going to say, um, Astoria, right? <laughs> right. They, Microsoft had a project, Astoria, which was about bringing Android apps to Windows, uh, not just yeah. taking the APX, whatever they're called, and running them directly, but you yeah. know, bring the code in and, and create a Windows app out of it. And that worked too well, <laughs> based right. on what I was told at the time. That project was disbanded. Those people were scattered uh, to different parts of Microsoft uh, because at that time it was very important for to Microsoft that they push their own native apps, and the ability to run Android apps on native natively on Windows was, I think, scary to them. Ah, um, yeah. In the years since, I mean, the couple of things that have happened is uh, Chromebooks now run Android apps, and that experience has been mixed. But that ability is important because there aren't necessarily a lot of apps on Chromebooks. And then, of course, Apple has brought iOS apps and I guess mm -hmm. iPad apps to the Mac. In both those cases, there's been, you know, mixed results. I mean, for sure. It's yeah. kind of ironic that given all the great stuff going around the M1 chipset, that the one bad experience that people kind of reported on was iOS apps. <laughs> you know, kind of right. not necessarily great mm -hmm. because, you know, the Mac doesn't have touch and those apps should be changed in some way to account for the kind of mouse and keyboard input that um, – those computers have so mm -hmm. you know whatever they'll 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 get there but usually when you do something like that or i should say in, in those two particular instances where they did do that the mobile platform in question has a much higher number of apps available or many more apps available and that's why you're doing it and your user base has those devices and they're using those apps and maybe there would be some benefit to bringing them to the desktop platform but, uh, but you're right on windows it's like uh, um i know I guess I when know. I think about it, one of the, you know, having an iPhone and uh, having a Mac and now having that synchronicity, yeah. that synergy is really nice. And so I really okay. like the idea, um, yeah. at least for me, from a mobile perspective of what what PC is or what computer is going to pair well with my Android device, let's make okay. that easier for those uh, folks to make the decision, right. okay, I can get a Windows PC and I can get many of the same apps there so that it's, yeah. I see this as a benefit. I do agree, you know, Mary Jo, certainly that it kind of takes away from the, um, almost the luster of, of creating a <laughs> Windows app that you, you know, you put in the app store. Um, but maybe and, that's not a big deal. At this oh, point, exactly. Right? That's I mean, kind of what yeah. I'm wondering is, you know, yeah, the, the way Microsoft is today, we kind of meeting customers where they, they are. I mean, maybe we don't need to be precious about a native app platform on Windows anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, there, but, you know, there's, there's so many pros and cons to this. I mean, obviously, uh, if there are apps you use every day on your phone, it'd be nice to get them on your desktop. Um, mm -hmm. OK, that's fine. One of the problems I've experienced on Chromebooks is because there are two app stores, two different types of apps, you run into the situation where you have two different apps of the same name and they right. have different capabilities. So like Microsoft Word for Android has a certain feature set that's good and bad and different, whatever. Uh, Microsoft Word on the web, which is the version you would use in a Chromebook, has a different set of features and capabilities. And, and sometimes it's better on the web, sometimes it's better on mobile. Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't mind running Outlook Mobile on desktop yeah. that would I wonder if it means your phone but, which is a separate app today gets merged into <clears throat> Windows because the way you do this experience today like say you have Spotify on your phone and you want to run it on your Windows PC you use your phone right and you can access that app if you have the correct kind of phone and you can pull that app up on your Windows PC and work with it there right so what if they decide they can integrate this your phone experience right into the operating system and you won't have to have a separate app? Because I don't know about yeah. you, but like when I try to connect my your phone app to a new PC or a new device, it's way <laughs> harder than it should be. <laughs> yeah. So actually, again, we just we could just go down fantasy lane and kind of speculate yeah. about how, how this could work. I mean. <laughs> Um, remotely running an app off your phone is better than nothing, I guess. Um, yeah. if you just, if you want to just do that, um, sure. Yeah. Um, if that thing came up and said, Hey, um, you could install this thing locally and then your phone wouldn't have to be on. You don't have to sign into it. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff because, oh yeah, okay. And 
you know, whatever it is, if the, uh, you know, Instagram or your music app or email app or whatever it might be. Um, yeah, I mean, that's of interest, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we're going to run into the same problem that Apple and Chromebook users are seeing, which is these apps right. are made for mobile devices. You right. Know? Yeah. And we do have touch. Well, I mean, that. I was going to say works. that at least in, in your case, you have uh, the touch functionality. That yeah. was what I was kind of yeah. thinking about this morning as I remembered that I could reach out and touch this Surface Laptop 3 um, <laughs> with the yeah. with the right. uh, Windows part, you know, the, the touch Targets are very small for a finger, but if I was running an Android app on my actual Windows PC, that starts to, to be pretty cool. And I know podcasts are one of the big places where people have, they're very particular about their podcast apps. And so being able to have a little podcast app open in the background while they're doing other things, um, that, yeah, cool. I mean, it's something to get used to. I mean, you know, Mary Jo, one of the things she was taught, I don't know if you mentioned it on the show, but earlier you were talking about how this computer has like a 16 by nine screen. Yeah. And the computer you were using before is three by two, which is square, squarish mm -hmm. or whatever. And yep. so <clears throat> that takes a little bit of a transition time. You know, it's a little mm -hmm. weird. Uh, a lot of the phone apps, of course, are going to come up like a little portrait mode things, right? And when mm -hmm. you're used to those that maybe fill the screen or take up a big portion of the screen, these little phone windows look, you know, they look kind of weird. But yeah, that's something, you know, you can get used to. I mean, it might even be fine. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, like a music app, you could say, well, I'm, look, I'm just using it to trigger a playlist. Who cares how, what it looks like? I just, you know, mm. it's just nice to have it there. Yeah. And I'm already, I already feel that way on the, on the Mac. There are several yeah. uh, apps that I use all the time on iOS <laughs> that it doesn't, mm -hmm. I, that's the thing is that I don't think this has to make sense to everyone for it to be a benefit <laughs> overall because there are it people who It doesn't even have to have, make sense. It doesn't even have to make sense. <laughs> there are people who love, love, love the apps yep. that they have on their devices. And if they can have it on their uh, PCs or their their Macs or whatever, uh, it, it's just a benefit. So it's an added thing so as opposed actually, to any sort of subtraction. Since you since you mentioned it, um, I'm curious, and maybe you know this already or don't or whatever, but you know, one of the interesting things on Android is, uh, at least on a Chromebook, if you run an Android app, on a Chromebook and you kind of stretch out the window, depending on the app, if it's designed to work on a tablet too, mm -hmm. it will stretch out into its tablet version or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, do the iOS or iPadOS apps on the Mac do that or are they separate or how does that work? Uh, so unfortunately, yeah, without an M1 Mac, uh, I don't know that, but you will be able to ask okay. Leo that question next week because he's got an okay. M1 Mac. The, <laughs> right. the apps that's that are also, available. I mean, it's also part of the dream, right? So Exactly. I was saying like some, like, uh, let's say you were using YouTube music and it, it comes up and it's like a little portrait mode phone screen shape thing. Uh, if you, if you full screened it or whatever, would it look like the tablet version, you know, where you would actually right. use that space and, you know, that would be nice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because there, for many of those apps that is built in. So you would think that that's how it works. I'm, I'm actually curious to that myself, um, because the yeah. ones that are available to me right now are ones that have uh, Mac sort of counterparts where they've kind of redesigned them because uh, I, I run an Intel Mac. Yeah. But for the M1, they can just run the iOS app. Yeah, whatever the so, app yeah. is. Yeah. I'm okay. curious. Mm -hmm. Well, I just don't like, for example, not to get deep, <laughs> go too deep into this, but, um, you know, if you're browsing the App Store on an iPad and you download uh, Microsoft Word, you're going to get the, like the tablet version, mm -hmm. I guess. I know it's probably a universal app, but when you run it on an iPhone, you're getting the version that runs only in that little, you know, screen shape. I mean, I don't know that, I don't know if that platform has this same capability to detect the screen it's running on and adapt accordingly. Yeah. That's a good question. Know. But well, as you said, that is kind of the, the dream, the ideal uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And we'll be back with more, but let's take a quick break because I am excited to tell you that this episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Thinkst Canary. With everything that is going on in the world, Thinkst Canary wants you to know they are here for you. Data breaches are on the rise and companies usually find out too late that they have been compromised even after spending millions on IT security. Canary is designed to be installed, configured, and most likely forgotten about in minutes. If you do need to be alerted, Canary gives you the option of deciding how you'd like to be told, email or text message on your console, Slack, webhooks, syslog, or their API. That means you could set up a, a bit of an automation and get a flashing light whenever you need to be notified by Canary. Alerts should be dead, simple, and easy to work with, conforming to your needs, not the other way around. And thanks to Canary, 
Luminary has made that possible. You won't be inundated with alerts either. You get one only when it matters. Two things all companies should know when it comes to data breaches. Hackers obviously take the path of least resistance. And in many cases, that's your staff. It takes on average 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Can we just hear that again? On average, it takes 191 days for a company to realize there's been a data breach. Here is how Canary works. It looks identical to a router, a switch, a NAS server, a Linux box, or a Windows server, so attackers can't tell the difference. Things to Canaries don't look vulnerable on your network. They look valuable and appealing. You can put fake files on them or enroll them in Active Directory, and when attackers investigate further, well, they give themselves away and you're instantly notified. The company behind Canary has been in the security game for almost two decades. They've trained companies, militaries, and governments how to break into networks and have used that knowledge to build Canary. Thanks to Canaries are deployed all over the world on all seven continents and are one of the best tools against data breaches. Visit canary.tools slash twit and for just $7,500 per year, you'll get five canaries, your own hosted console, upgrades, support, and maintenance. And if you use code TWIT in the How Did You Hear About Us box, you're going to get 10% off that price, not just right away, but for life. We know you'll love your Thinkst Canary, but if you're not happy, you can always return your Canaries with a two-month money-back guarantee for a full refund. That's canary.tools slash twit and enter the code twit in the how did you hear about us box. Thanks so much to Thinkst Canary for sponsoring this week's episode of Windows Weekly. All right, if you're in the market for... Uh, Microsoft 365, uh, the business premium version. It, uh, is it in the market? Yeah, on the market. If you're looking for an <laughs> upgrade, you can get the premium version on sale, right? Yeah, and actually, maybe Mary Jo knows this. Has this ever happened before? Has there ever been an announced sale on a, a, a Microsoft or Office 365 commercial SKU? I have never heard of Question. anything like this. Maybe, maybe some of these 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 business premium ones are in the SMB category, small mid sized business, not the enterprise ones. Uh, right. So maybe okay. there. Yep. Um, but yeah, it is right. a little bit unusual. So just to, to kind of position this, the uh, the basic, and it's literally called Microsoft 365 Business Basic, but the basic version for commercial customers, small businesses, businesses of any size, is uh, five dollars per month. Uh, with an annual commitment, so sixty dollars a year. Um, the one that I subscribe to, and I think you do too, right? Or do you subscribe to Basic? I do. Mary basic jo, is yeah. um, Business yeah. Standard, so that's twelve fifty per month, and and uh, per user per month. Uh, the difference between this and the Basic version is you get all the uh, the Office apps to install in your up to five computers, right? They both include a terabyte of storage and the cloud access and all that stuff. Business premium is the next step up. Now, this is normally $20 per user per month, so it's actually a significant additional cost, but it's 25% off now. So if you, um, for up to, I think you can, well, I can just look instead of saying I think. Um, yeah, for those that need, can, you can purchase up to 25 seats, right, or 25 subscriptions for one year for 25% off. And if you need more than that, you just pay the normal price. But it brings it down pretty close to the cost of business standard. So that's potentially very interesting. The mm -hmm. difference in the feature set, though, is uh, it's kind of hard to quantify. I mean, <laughs> uh, I would say the big thing that you get is Intune, um, which for device management support, which is actually pretty good, uh, cloud-based uh, device management, PC and device, and then some advanced threat protection features, um, which I think are probably a, a lot more interest to what I will call a med medium-sized business, like something that's not a small business, something that's not quite an enterprise, but they're kind of heading in that direction. So I, I guess what I'd say is it's kind of a more of a managed, it's even more of a managed account, if you will. Um, and the features that you're getting are not so much features that the end users necessarily would care about, but they're features that might be important to your organization. Mm. Anyway, a sale's a sale. <laughs> it's not, not quite Black Friday. Um, it's very I don't, limited like I, I don't, time though, isn't it? It, it is like, a limited it's time. It's really... only, in fact, it only goes through the 30th. So you have, yeah. what, five days, six days mm -hmm. if you want to so do it. So hop on it. Uh, <laughs> get, get going. Exactly. 
Mm-hmm. So it's, I guess you're saving $5, you're saving $60 per year per user. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you're saving it unless if you don't need it, <laughs> but assuming you need <laughs> this functionality, certainly you are. It's for new customers only. I, yeah. uh, is that true? Wait, I keep saying things without knowing that whether it's true. <laughs> It is. And that's a podcast, <laughs> folks. It's like, I think it's true. Yeah, it is. It's available only to new Microsoft 365 commercial customers. I got to uh, work now, on that. <laughs> over in the. It sounds in the, true. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, it rings I saw true. Bigfoot once. <laughs> that's <think>. true. <laughs> um, now, this is, is an, a, an, excuse me, new for Teams, which is uh, Microsoft adding some consumer features uh, to both the desktop and web app versions of Teams. You know, I tried out Teams. I was curious kind of about Teams in comparison to Slack. Yep. And so I created a Teams account and I uh, hilariously and ill-advisedly uh, published the invite link on my Twitter um, oh, and said, hey, come join my team. I just want to see how this works. <laughs> and you know what? The people who joined, everybody was very cool, very nice. It was all good. But the one thing that bothered me was I couldn't, it would not let me for the whole time that I was running it, update the photo, <laughs> the avatar or Jeez. whatever you want to call it, the, well, the main cool. photo for the team. Yeah, yeah. It kept uh, sort of erroring out. That's, so when uh, you said you created an account, um, do you mean, th- did you connect to it with a, um, like a Microsoft account, like an email address or whatever? Like I, you don't have a Microsoft 365 commercial account. Correct. I do not have a commercial account. Okay. You um, did the free so, Teams thing somehow? Yes. I th- I must have done the free. May, somehow yeah, that's I, a different yeah. experience. Ah, so, okay. So it is yeah, a little I mean, if you Yeah, if you were part of Microsoft 365, typically what would happen is you'd be working for a company and they, they use Microsoft 365. So you have Teams and you use Teams to, you know, communicate and collaborate and all that stuff. Um, you would have a user portal where you could go and change that picture and that would be where that happens. I don't think it's in the app because, you know, they it, it's done centrally because it would apply everywhere in Microsoft 365 is gotcha. my guess. Well, I know, I know that that's the case. My guess is that it's not in the app for that reason. That makes sense. Um, yeah. Any because we, yeah, Go ahead. Teams is actually is actually pretty amazing. It's it's getting big, and you know, yeah. <laughs> they're starting to add too much to it. But it does do a lot of stuff. <laughs> and um, you know, a couple of years ago, when we tried it within my own little small company to transition to it, it was impossible. It just didn't do what we needed it to do. And now we use it. I mean, it's every single day. It's Mm. completely different story. It reminds well, that's one me. one of the things that I've noticed is that it it uh, seems to give people even more than, you know, what you would normally get from um, from from Slack. And I've got quite oh, a few yeah, friends. Oh, it's not even close. No, it's crazy. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's become like an all-in-one portal to everything you do at work. And so if you have files stored up in, you know, SharePoint or OneDrive, you can view them in, within Teams. You don't even have to leave. Uh, they It does calendar doesn't do email yet, but that will be the final frontier. I mean, once it does, e- does email, I, I don't it's, know why you would use anything else. But, yeah. um, you know, no, all the meeting every, capabilities, the ability it, to record meetings and transcribe them and search no. by audio. And it just goes on and on. It's crazy. Like, it, it's uh, yeah, yeah. there's an app platform you, built into it. It used to be a collaboration hub like Slack, but now it's an everything hub, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's even for developers yeah. now. They've added in yeah. Power Power Platform uh, integration. And it's... It, it reminds me of how SharePoint became this sprawling, yes. all-encompassing yep. thing. It started you know, out as a document management system, right? And then it became <laughs> everything. <laughs> this is the so – that's a great comparison. You know, I, I usually compare it to uh, Outlook, and, and but yeah. you're, you're right. Yours is even better. Um, Microsoft platforms that get successful turn into these multi-headed monsters, you know. They do. Um, yeah. They just they're like pile everybody's on. there, so we need to add everything to that platform yes. quick. Ex- exactly. It has its own yeah. app store inside of Teams that's oh separate yep. from Goodness. the Microsoft Store. There is apps. no need that we will not accommodate <laughs> in Teams. <laughs> right, you know, and now right. to make it even bigger and more all-encompassing, they're adding <laughs> consumer yep. features to Teams. Right, so what what they're trying to do is to get people to also use Teams for home type organizational tasks. So they cite as examples things like, you know, you're organi- organizing your soccer squad, you know, soccer mom, soccer dad. You want to keep track of everybody and have everybody be able to compare schedules and talk. So you could use Teams. Why not, right? Um, 
So the way they're trying to go about this is adding consumer features into Teams. They've already done that on the Teams apps for iOS and Android. And now they're adding these consumer features to the Teams Windows desktop application. So um, there's all these kinds of things they've, they're starting to roll out now, like syncing existing chats from your phone or computer to your Windows desktop, um, start chats for up to 250 people in a group, and talk all day for free with your friends and family on video or audio calls. Like all these things are getting integrated now for per a Microsoft personal account, not just your work account, so that you can use them on the Windows desktop. I'm, wonder, I'm very curious how this is going to be received, yeah. if a lot of people are going to use this or not. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how I set this up in the first place because I yeah. definitely, <laughs> uh, somehow I created a Teams account. Um, maybe it was, was, when did Teams, no, Teams has been around for a while, so I don't know. Were they doing yeah. maybe a pandemic thing where they made Teams yep. free to sign up or something whenever the pandemic yep. was first hitting? Yep. There is a free um, version. Yeah, so I don't, that's why I asked. I wasn't sure. I'm not even off the top of my head. I assume what they must allow you to do. I should assume. See, let's see what's happening <laughs> to me today. You know the Based Ryan on my Paul. memory, which is sketchy at best. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it seems like, yeah, it can't just be available to people who are paying for it through Microsoft 365. So there is a free version of Teams. Mm -hmm. It includes whatever feature set it features. But I'm, yeah, how do you, count doesn't sign expire, up. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah. like, how do you sign into, you must have signed in with a, so, I assume it was um, a Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking it's, now, like, I've, I've created some sort of organization. I must have hacked this thing. That's what, no, I'm just kidding. No, it's, um, maybe this is, okay, yeah. So in other words, you enter an email and if it's already a Microsoft account, you can use that, yeah. but it literally just says you, you will use this email to set up Teams. I, you could probably just sign in with an arbitrary account. That must've been yeah. what I did then, yeah. Um, and I've got people in my organization. <laughs> um, and yeah, so the only thing, like I said, that I was, annoyed by was the fact that I couldn't sort of uh, create a, an yeah, icon to yeah, represent yeah. the organization. I think this is a... Okay, um, here we go. I found it. People who okay. do not already have a paid Microsoft 365 commercial subscription can get the free version of Teams. So if you don't have the paid Microsoft uh, 365, you're eligible for the free version. Yeah. That's what yeah. I did then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Oh, because what, what happened, it was interesting on uh, the computer. I tried to log in because uh, if you go to yeah. Microsoft.com or if you go to the Teams page, you can sign in on the web. I went to try to right. sign in on the web and it just kept doing a redirect, 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 sure. redirect. And then it said there was an error. <laughs> so I launched it on the uh, on the app on the Surface laptop and that let yeah. me log in finally. But now it's yeah. not letting me accept. I've got like uh, 20 people pending um, <laughs> acceptance. Oh, maybe of the your limit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's they're a, like, I'm no, sure you can't have any more. Right on the number of users. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Hmm. But I, so this is the thing. A lot of people started using Discord, Zoom, and in some cases Slack for personal uh, uses where, you know, like you said, the the group's getting together, the group's talking, yeah. and it didn't have to be for a work thing. So mm -hmm. if you do that on uh, on uh, Teams, I think that's good for Microsoft because it just means that more people not only uh, sort of touch the Teams uh, interface, yeah. but yeah. especially if you've got that, I, I know I keep using the word synergy and that's a gross word and we all roll our eyes, but <laughs> if you use it for work and then you can so easily switch yeah. over to it for your personal, I think right. that's pretty great. There, there are advantages to using one thing. Right. Um, right. You know, one of the confusions for me right now is I've got some people are on Teams and some people are on Skype. So I have to run both and, you know, messages will, will come in on either or the other or whatever. And, and that's just the reality for now. I mean, someday when Teams kind of subsumes Skype, as we expect, probably be able to just use Teams, you know, and that's that's yeah. fine. But um, that's another point I, but, of confusion, right? Because Microsoft has not said Teams with consumer features is as a successor to Skype. They have not said that. In fact, they've said that isn't the case. Whenever you right, ask them, they're but, like, no, you know, Skype, 
the, Skype is a simpler thing and it only does chat and video and it's for people who just want to do that. But if you want to do all the other stuff that Teams does, that's a different thing. I'm so, sure not that this is a bait and switch per se, but I'm sure some element of the free teams, especially this year during the pandemic where they're letting you talk, for, you know, all day and there's no limits and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, at some point they're going to say, look, um, yeah, we got to, we got to stop. You this need now. to have a Microsoft account to access some of this stuff. You're going to need a Microsoft 365 account, even if it's one of the individual or family plans or something to access certain features. Right. And that's reasonable. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't yeah. think anybody you know, every well, I shouldn't say that. People will complain, you know, when they turn up some of the free <laughs> right. stuff. But it's certainly reasonable to expect that. Um, and maybe, you know, by you you tried it. I mean, you you thought enough to try it, and whatever mm -hmm. you thought of it. I mean, some people might try this and say this is great. Yep, mm -hmm. and they'll so. want to use this going forward. You know, and especially they've just started if you've got everything on, in there. Right. They've just started turning on the ability to switch from your Teams account for personal and team's business account yeah. within the single client. So before you couldn't have team like the both both of those things together and switch between them, but they're starting to roll that out now so that you can switch well seamlessly, you know, the, supposedly. The more important <laughs> feature here to me is the one that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Um, yeah. which is the ability to have multiple commercial accounts right. uh, in one client. Because one of the issues today is yeah. you only have one. So you know, uh, you were talking about the web client. When I get, depending on who I'm doing business with at the time, I might have to use a different account. I'll, I'll use mm -hmm. it through the web browser because I don't want to screw up my my yep. app is signed <laughs> into my main account. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a goofy thing that you can't switch accounts. So it is. I assume yeah. th this is going like the same kind of feature they'll implement for multiple commercial accounts right. as well at some point. Yeah, yeah. The room, that's rumored to come next year at some point now, but yeah. we don't. No, because they won't say. Yeah. When I uh, some of the stuff I don't quite get. So, some some of the the point of mingling, um, commingling personal and work is obvious yeah. enough. You know, mm -hmm. I have a personal calendar. I put stuff on it. The people yeah. I work with won't necessarily see that what I'm doing, but they can see that some mm -hmm. time is blocked off, and they know not to. You know, if it's a doctor's appointment or something that I wanted to keep private or whatever, uh, all they need to know is I won't be in the office or whatever, and they yeah. can they can see that and work around it. And uh, there's some value to that for sure. Um, you know, using Microsoft Teams to create like a family list, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, is like okay, right? I don't, I, don't, I, I, mm. I don't see my family ever doing that. <laughs> Let us talk <laughs> about. This, uh, for anyone who's <laughs> listening and has no idea what is happening right now, I'm talking about Credge. Um, Mary Jo, you have an article about some shopping features being added to Edge, I guess in the spirit of Instagram changing out its like icon, its, uh, <laughs> its activities icon at the bottom of the screen for the My shopping page. The, the person that changed Instagram, I would never <laughs> stop squeezing it. <laughs> I can't stand what they did to Instagram. It's so bad. Sorry. It's so bad. It's, tangent, bad. But it's really bad. Seriously, could you make it harder to post something new now? I have to look at I like a shopping and a video link instead. Yeah, how do you? Yes, that's so annoying that the, the post know. thing has changed too. And I've got, I mean, you know, this is partial complaint, partial like, I don't, I still don't know what a humble brag is. So if it's not one, then I'm sorry. <laughs> but I got the, the biggest possible iPhone you can get. And now trying to reach yeah. across that thing with my right. thumb to get yeah. to exactly. the top. It's to like post. eight inches away. Yes, I just it's want, I just want to post a photo. Which, I know. Forgive me if Which I'm wrong. Which is what Isn't Instagram was for, I thought. I know. <laughs> it's, oh, I know. It's but like, anyway, I don't French. want to make it real. I don't. <laughs> yep. No, uh, it's, it's, Facebook has gone the same direction. It's like they have this video yeah. thing. And yeah. the video view always has a notification on it. And you can't get rid of it unless you look at it. <laughs> so it forces me to look at videos and then go out of videos because I don't want to look at those videos. They're stupid. Anyway, sorry, that has nothing to do with Microsoft Edge, but well, yes, it yeah. does. Yeah, well, it does in a way. I'm going to teach you how you can turn this feature off, but go on. Okay, <laughs> so I didn't even know this feature existed, but it I, I guess I was in the test group because it happened to me automatically. So I was checking out right. in a shopping experience online, and all of a sudden, um, Edge started applying all these <laughs> promo codes and coupons into my shopping cart without me right. doing anything. And I'm like, what is happening right now? It's 
like trying to find a coupon for me um, on my behalf, I guess. So this is the idea that Edge will automatically look for coupons when you're about to check out using the browser. Like so, Honey? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I guess. That like app, Honey? honey? Right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is for U.S. markets only on Windows and iOS coming soon to Android. Uh, I was using it on the desktop with Windows, and I was very confused what was happening, and then I found out later I must have been in a test group because it just started rolling out now, and it happened to me like a week or two ago. I'm, I'm uh, really worried that Edge is getting uh, I team, know. teamsified, right? Yeah, like, I, know. It, I know. They're, they're overloading the UI with all of these kind of, we'll call them Edge-specific features. Yeah. At least you can turn it off, um, but yeah. How do you man, turn it off? I, I was it's curious. In settings, about you have to go to the. It's God, so hidden, like everything else in Edge settings. Yeah. It's like you go to Privacy, Search, and Services, and then okay. way down the bottom somewhere, there's a section called Save Time and Money with Shopping. Yeah, and uh, it's under uh, Services. You could just right. turn it off, and then it just won't they do also, that. Because yeah, I saw. That. Ahead, yeah, they have the price comparison thing in Edge now too, right? It was just in collections inside of Edge, but now they're applying it across the browser. Yeah. So you can click a blue tag to see a list of price on products from different retailers all in a single place, which if you're looking around and shopping around, maybe you want that. But it's another one of those. I'm like, do I really want my browser to just do that on my behalf? I don't know. <laughs> Microsoft's always had trouble with what I'll call like uh, superfluous notifications. So yeah. the the, the yeah. shopping and edge version of that is, uh, I, I don't know if I was in Amazon or wherever I was, but I was doing something and it said, this is the best price for this product. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> like it actually popped up something. That's like back in the yeah. day, I don't remember when this was. Like remember Windows used to have this little pop-up and say, your computer is safe. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> What? You know, it's like, like there's nothing wrong. Safe. Thanks for telling me. Yeah. Just want to let yeah. you know where we're here in the background. You know. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. Everything's fine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything's up. good. You Keep look fine. good today, Paul. <laughs> well, Keep okay, shopping. That would be nice. Just go, go for it. I know. You know, you know it's it's all about them. Just like adding personal features to Teams, same thing. They want to go after consumers at Microsoft, even though. Their yeah. wheelhouse is the enterprise and business customers, but they're dying to get more consumers, you know, so they keep consumerifying everything, right? And it's like, guys, not everybody wants all this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. It's uh, The good news is, uh, whether, whatever you feel about shopping, some people will love this feature. It's like anything yeah. else. It's like focused yeah. inbox. Some people hate it. Right. Some people love it, you know? Um, no one so it. whatever, teach their own. It's fine. But, <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, it's fine. It's, it's cool. I mean, look, if you do a lot of shopping in a web browser, I mean, this is kind of, people download like the Honey uh, I know. Uh, extension, like you said. I mean, you know, it's useful. It's fine. But yeah. there's, there is actually a bunch of other stuff in this update. Uh, that would be more broadly useful to people, including a bunch of features that were in the legacy version of Edge that were, weren't before in this version and now are. Uh, annotation capabilities uh, on PDFs, for example. Um, you know, digital link support on uh, screenshots. Uh, and then I, this isn't there now, but I think sometime next month they're going to add the ability to screenshot an entire page, meaning in, you know beyond what you can see in the browser window. That's such like a helpful one click. I like that. Super one. nice. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's a controversial feature. Have you run into this yet where you uh, copy and paste a, a URL and That's when you terrible. paste it, it automatically creates a short URL? From what? No, what service? Oh. It's built into the browser. Oh, oh from no, what? Oh, it's that, yeah. So I what's the I was confusing the, uh, that URL? with the one oh. where you copy and paste now and it preserves the formatting, which sometimes you don't want that, right? You right, don't want right. the formatting That's preserved. Sure. So, so the, it takes Microsoft's own URL shortening service and makes yeah. your link in. I don't like that. That's a thing. No, you can turn I don't off, like right? that either. Uh -uh. Here's the good news: you can turn it off. Also, you could uh, <laughs> arbitrarily choose not to use it. So if you know Control V on Windows is paste, Control Shift V in the uh. Edge browser will paste the normal URL. But you can go into actually when you right click something, that to paste you can choose a. There's a link for changing the default, so you can change it back. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. But it is enabled by default. Of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> Which it shouldn't be. It should be the other way around. Yeah. I, agree. I mean, I, 
Sort Control shift like V to shorten. Paste after it changes, it should pop up and say something. Yeah. Do you Just like so this? You know, Clippy pops well, because up because those short says. URLs can look uh, suspicious to people. Exactly. Right. It's like, hey, Bob, you should uh, browse this link on the Apple website, and then the address is like ms dot whatever you know whatever it is. And it's like, wait, what? What am yeah, I, I just, what am I opening here? I just got one the other day and a little off topic, but it was really fascinating to me because of how good it was. Um, yeah. One of Facebook's old uh, short text message services that it used, like one of its old short numbers must have gone mm -hmm. back into circulation. And so some bad actor picked it up and they sent me a Don't notification worry. saying, uh, yeah. if you'd like to short or if you'd like to uh, change your Instagram password, he, you know, click this link. And it came out of nowhere. And so yeah. I yeah, looked yeah. for the shortened link online, uh, just the, the shortening service itself, yeah. and couldn't find it. And so it was that was wow. a clever one to do. So I don't like short links in general. I like to use unshorten.it or unshorten it uh, to check short links because it yeah. will basically unshorten the URL for you. I think I, there seems to be a push in the web browser world to simplify URLs for some reason and maybe yeah. to kind of get rid of them. Um, I, I like, you know, this is confusing to people or something, but I, I don't know. I don't quite yeah. get it. I know Chrome's doing some stuff around this too, aren't they? Experimenting with shortening URLs right in the address bar or showing you just the top just level part. part of the URL or something like that. Yeah. Safari already does that. Um, it just shows you the top level and you can disable that. The thing that I do like about that is that sometimes someone will do like a, uh, you know, fake dot com dot Facebook dot org or whatever. And so then you think mm -hmm. that it's Facebook if you see the whole URL, but this one just shows you the top level part of it. Uh, so I see the benefits there, but yeah, overall don't shorten my links unless I ask for it. I know. Yep. <laughs> Any yeah. other cool features added? That's right. Actually, cool actually cool features. features. <laughs> yeah, the actually cool features. Some new tab features. There's, um, you know, including, remember, the, if you sign in with a corporate account, you have that uh, new search experience. You have that new tab experience. And I guess they've added a, a way you can toggle, just like in Teams we were talking about, on the new tab experience for commercial users, you can toggle between your work and personal information. So you might have a Microsoft account that is your personal stuff and a commercial account that is your, you know, your work stuff. So, uh, I don't know. Automatic redirection of incompatible sites from Internet Explorer it probably deserves about 10 minutes. Um, you know, <laughs> there's always lots of stuff. Wait, so if it doesn't work in Internet Explorer, it will pop open it in Microsoft Edge? Is that what that means? Yeah, this is for um, commercial customers. So it is most likely something that would be managed by your company. So the, the idea is that your company has said this site is incompatible with Internet Explorer. So if you try to open it in Internet Explorer anyway, it will go to Edge. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, actually, that's a good one because that probably saves 10 calls a day to the IT department. <laughs> I can't get this this page to work. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of begs the question, like, why is anyone using Internet Explorer at this point? And it's probably ding, ding, because ding, ding, your company needs it for certain legacy sites, yeah. you know. Yeah. Before we talk about more Microsoft news, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about Barracuda. Barracuda is the provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect emails, networks, data, and applications. They get all of it. Suddenly, you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. Get this statistic. This is Maybe believable to some of you, maybe unbelievable to some of you. 91% of all cyber attacks start in an email. 91%. There's spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees times how many emails? Oof. One click on the wrong email can cost you money. It can cost you customers. And most importantly, it can cost you your reputation. Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase, unfortunately, in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they've observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of February. Get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total Email Protection. It includes all-in-one email security, backup, and archiving, 
AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise, an automated incident report that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks, and security awareness training to educate your workforce so your employees can be the first line of defense against attacks. Email threats are absolutely prevalent right now and include uh, several, as we said, related to coronavirus, um, including recent scams involving uh, fake solutions for coronavirus care and coronavirus cures, uh, where they will redirect you and steal your login credentials and potentially infect the user with malware uh, by offering up these fake cures for coronavirus. It's insidious. It's terrible. And you should be protected. Right now, there are new attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization. Ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account risk-free at barracuda.com slash windows. That's barracuda.com slash windows. Barracuda, your journey secured. Thanks so much to Barracuda for sponsoring this week's episode of Windows Weekly. All right. Ah, here's a little bit of a of a retrospective for the 700th episode, yeah. and uh, that is a look back at what um, Bill Gates got right and got wrong in his book, The Road <laughs> Ahead. This is based on a Bill Gates blog post talking about that stuff, and it's interesting because I had kind of forgotten this, but you know, back in 1995 when this book was written, he was talking about. Um, what he called digital agents, which today we call the digital assistants, Cortana, Siri, Alexa, uh, Google Assistant. Um, that was pretty forward looking, you know, <laughs> although he says um, these things are not as uh, sophisticated as he envisioned that they would be, you know, 25 <laughs> years ago, which is kind of interesting. We're with you there. Um, but, you know, what, you know, what he doesn't say, and I find, I find this to be somewhat fascinating, this book was really controversial uh, because when it came out, it barely mentioned the internet, <laughs> you know, ah. um, it, and I mean, a month after this came out, Microsoft did its giant pivot where they embraced the internet and, um, you know, mm -hmm. announced internet Explorer and, and they were, they fully embraced the web. And he actually came out with a second edition of the book that added the word internet about 150 times just to, <laughs> to make it. A <laughs> wow. Um, so a year later, almost a year later, they came yeah. up with a, uh, a revised version of the book. But um, yeah, I mean, back then, you know, Microsoft, well, you know, propri proprietary software company, they were still thinking very proprietary. So he saw the need for networks, obviously, and worldwide global networks and all that. But I'm sure he uh, envisioned that Microsoft being the gatekeeper of that thing, <laughs> you know, at the um, time. Um, so, you know, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. But Yeah, I remember when this came out. It kind of solidified my distaste for these kinds of books, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, I, I was reading yeah. the Wikipedia entry about it. They're like, it got a reception as being very tepid. I'm like, that's a good word for how this book was tepid, because, yeah. you know, it used a lot of management jargon and like big ideas. And I'm like, yeah, but tell us what you actually think about what's going to happen next because you actually right. have done a lot of Comdex presentations yeah, exactly. where he you've used to shown talk us about this stuff all the time. Right. Yeah. And it used yeah. to be great. It used to be amazing. You'd be like, wow, is that really the future? And then you read this and you're like, wait, is, what happened between that and the book? Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I look, I, I, I don't know. It's anyone who knows anything about Bill Gates, it probably has a little bit of a problem with the tech visionary thing, but yeah. I mean, he did foresee uh, the digital transformation stuff that we're ha that's happening today. Yeah. He saw, video on demand very early. They had a project called Tiger that was seeking to basically make Netflix back in the nineties. <laughs> uh, he saw pocket computers, of course, yeah. uh, many, many years before we have iPhones and Androids and things like that. So, I mean, he, yeah. you know, but no, he, yeah, the, he the blind spot on the experience. internet, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. a little weird. But then he, you, you did mention this, but he is now going to write another book um, yeah. which is called how to avoid a climate disaster where he's talking about climate change. And, right. um, yeah, this, this could be given what he does now with the Gates foundation, I think a little more sweeping and maybe more interesting. 
it'll definitely be more sobering. Um, <laughs> Probably mention the internet a lot in it. Just uh, yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> yes. The, if we could just turn off all those data centers, we wouldn't have global warming. Yeah. <laughs> I told you the internet was bad. I don't know why you didn't pay attention in 1995. That's why I didn't mention it back then. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want I we could just sidestep it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's 25 years. Yeah. It's amazing it was 25 years ago. Nathan Mirvold um, was one of his collaborators on the book, which is interesting, yeah, okay. given that he went on to do it intellectual ventures. Yeah. I still have the contents of it on my NAS somewhere. I, I ran into it yeah. the other day. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if it would install these days. It's probably, I, I can't imagine <laughs> what they built. It. It's probably some encarta yeah. based thing or something. But. <laughs> uh, also, we have in, in, in this is interesting. Um, Microsoft uh, joins Apple and Amazon in saying, yeah. hey, so, so in this court case with Google, we'd really like it if you didn't share all of our data with Google um, right. because that wouldn't be great. Also, AT&T, Comcast, DuckDuckGo, yeah. Oracle, Sonos, and T-Mobile. Wow. Right. I, did, I yeah. just find this interesting because the all of these uh, big tech uh, internet antitrust cases are all based around this notion of gate, the gatekeeper, right? Apple is the gatekeeper mm -hmm. to iOS. Amazon is the gatekeeper to online shopping. Google is the gatekeeper basically to the internet or the web. And the idea there is that you're searching for things. And they, those companies control the searches. They see what you're searching for. And they can see what's popular. And they can offer up their own stuff instead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Amazon does that with the Amazon basic stuff. They're like, oh, look, batteries are selling great. Let's make batteries. Find the cheapest Chinese batteries you can get. Slap a logo on them and we'll, sell, we'll underprice <laughs> them accordingly and we'll sell a million of them. It's worked out pretty great, right? So basically these companies are like, we don't want Google to do this to us through the evidence we're providing in this case. The idea being that Google's lawyers will see the evidence, go back to Google and say, hey, uh, Apple's working on this thing that you might want to know about, whatever. And they would like this stuff to be marked as uh, confidential and not uh, it not be something that Google's lawyers could bring back to Google. Um so, you know, Google being Google has said, uh, we would never do that. What do you mean? Do stuff like that. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Come on. We're not going to do anything with it. Uh, alas, we, do we know it. better. I mean, say this. If it did happen, I mean, we would disclose that immediately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Now's the time where Mary Jo and I can pull out our fuzzy slippers, our bubble pipes, nice. and our glasses of um, chamomile tea. While uh, <laughs> while Paul takes over the show to talk about Xbox, no, I'm actually I'm interested in this because of the new Xboxes being out, yeah. uh, and also my partner is a big Xbox player, and there have been a couple of times where things you've said on the shows that I've been on, I've been able to go, you know, I I heard da 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 da, and so he's been talking a lot about Game Pass lately, and I was like, I know what Game Pass is. <laughs> anyway, nice. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, you know. I feel like we're on the cusp of everything changing, right? So Microsoft just released those two consoles. Sony obviously released a console. Um, but cloud streaming, cloud game streaming is like happening too, you know. And um, I feel like this is the real future. And this isn't in the notes, but one of the things I've, I've started doing over the past few days is testing the various cloud gaming services to kind of see how they mix and match and, you know, different features and so forth. And it's 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 actually, i got to say, it's really clear, uh, even right now, this stuff will replace consoles. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. But anyway, not today. So for today, <laughs> we're still dealing with kind of a mix of the new and the old. So uh, as everybody listening knows, every month Microsoft comes out with uh, four free games for people who are Xbox Live Gold subscribers. Uh, they announced those games yesterday. They're not going to be available till next week, but uh, this will be the last one for this year. It's not a particularly inspiring uh, collection of games. Um, and it also begs the question of whether or not uh, Xbox Live Gold and Games with Gold are going to persist to this time next year. Um, I don't think they will. I think game streaming and this online gaming library is going to take will take over for this. Uh, that's my guess. You know, there have been a lot of rumors about Xbox Live going away, Xbox Live Gold uh, to be replaced by Xbox Game Pass. So we shall see. But anyway, they're going out on uh, I wouldn't call it a sour note, but kind of a down note. Not not particularly interesting. Um, if you are a flight simulator fan, um, you should download the latest update, which makes the United States look prettier. 
which I think is something <laughs> we could all agree we need these days. Um, so I guess they bumped up a lot of the graphics for a lot of historic sites and famous sites, especially along the coast. So you can fly up and down the coast, including Alaska and Alaska. Yeah. A lot of that stuff is, uh, a lot nicer looking than it used to be. Um, I know people are going to ask when's it coming to Xbox, meaning flight simulator. Uh, I don't know. Next year, sometime next year. Um, and then with regards to game streaming, which is the project X cloud thing, which is a feature of Xbox game pass ultimate currently, this is very strange actually, um, has the best gaming library of any game streaming service only works with Android, <laughs> which is really oh, no. weird. Yeah. Um, all of the competing services, even like Amazon Luna, which is only in like an early preview of multiple clients across uh, many different platforms. Um, and so everyone's wondering, when's this stuff going to come to Windows? When's it going to come to the Mac and to the web and to iOS and iPad? Um, nobody knows. Well, Microsoft knows. We don't know. But uh, next year, certainly. Oddly, uh, Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox at Microsoft, had an interview with The Verge where he hinted at uh, this feature coming to smart TVs in 2021. I would say that would be the last place that this thing needs to show up. I mean, it should go to smart TVs, but I would bring it to PC, console, Mac, web, iOS first if I was running Xbox, but whatever. That's a good sign. I mean, that he's thinking about smart TVs tells me it will be everywhere, uh, just not this year. And speaking of things that are not happening this year, if you didn't get an Xbox, uh, one of the new ones, Series X, Series S, uh, the chances of you getting one between now and the end of the year are slim. It's not impossible. You could get luck out if you go, out, go to a Walmart or Best Buy or whatever, and they happen to get some stock in. But, um, you know, it's just like the PlayStation 5. I mean, they can't build them fast enough at this point, unfortunately, and they don't have enough. So mm -hmm. Microsoft, uh, sometime this past week, announced what they were going to be doing for Black Friday which, as everyone knows, is not a day anymore. It's a week-long event or whatever. Um, th there's no deals to be had on consoles, right? I mean, it's uh, software and services and controllers. So uh, Xbox Game Pass Ultimate will be 40% off for a three-month subscription, which, you know, <laughs> it's, Xbox Game Pass has been kind of going gangbusters. This might be a good chance to take a look at that. Um, lots of games, 55% uh, off on PC. Uh, I'm sorry, a console up to 60% uh, on uh, PC. Same thing, you know, it runs for a week. And then Xbox controllers uh, will be 20 bucks off. This is a great time to get a controller because the controllers are expensive. And I don't know if you handle your controller like an ape, like I do, but I break <laughs> controllers roughly every three months, 60 bucks a pop. Um, you can get them for $40 uh, this right now, actually, for the next several days. So, And those are all, those are available? Controllers? Those are available. Okay. I might have to get because... Well, his has good. the battery compartment missing, which I know I could just buy another battery compartment, but I also th I think it's pretty old. Yeah. No, so new, they've added uh, Bluetooth support, lower latency modes, and then the new version for the new consoles has kind of a grippier texture to it, and it has the share button, which is, honestly is awesome. It's one of the best features. Uh, what does the share button do? So if you want to share a screenshot or a, sc or, or a video clip on Xbox with, you know, previously, what you would have to do is hold down the, the white Xbox button and then mm -hmm. choose the appropriate choice in a menu. Now you just hit it, and you hit it, it will take a screenshot by default. You can configure it, or you can press and hold, and it will it will record the previous 30 seconds. Ah, cool, cool. I was about to ask oh, about the, the timing, because yeah. that was, it, how do you know? It, does it start the clip? So it's it's the previous 30 seconds. So after uh, every... Mary Jo snipes you in the game, then yes. you yeah, like, oh, I get to hit save that, that button. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't change those defaults, but one thing you could change if you wanted to, if you record a lot of video, you could uh, change that to trigger the beginning and ending of video recording. So you press ah, and hold and neat. start recording, and then you press and hold again, it will stop. So you can it's, it's your choice. You can, you can configure it. So the other one, this is just kind of related to this. Um, a GeForce Now, which is a service I got to say I, I hadn't paid too much attention to, announced this past week that they're, they have an iOS client. Now, this is interesting because Apple, as we know, is blocking game service, game streaming service clients on iOS. So they're doing it the way that uh, Amazon is doing it. They're doing it the way that Stadia and uh, Microsoft will be doing it. Um, it's a web client, right? And so it's, you use Safari on the device and it streams to the browser. And that's like, okay, that's cool. But that made me look at this service and the service is interesting because it's not really a standalone service. They do have a, some free games you can get and so forth, but it's really designed to work with other game piece like PC based gaming services like Steam and Epic Games and others 
where you already have these games, but you and you play them on a PC, but you want to play them somewhere else, right? It's actually a really good idea. They're not streaming from your PC. They're streaming from the cloud, like from the NVIDIA cloud. So um, you think I, I've, what guy, you think I would be able to <laughs> come up with one of these games? Uh, Destiny 2 was one of the ones I was testing. I feel like I need to bring this up because I've actually tested several games on this. It's pretty good. Um, so I have Destiny 2 is actually an example. I think this is one that's actually free through GeForce now. It's one of the few like really good games you can get for free. I played Black Mesa, which is the brand new version of the original Half-Life. Uh, and Just Cause uh, 2. Mm -hmm. And these are games that I own on other services, but they stream over the web, over the cloud, to whatever. So, for example, I have this little nut computer. It's basically like a laptop in a box. It's not a gaming PC. It couldn't play any of these games effectively. But because it's streaming from the cloud, it works fine. And you can see it, and it streams to, you know, web clients, mobile devices, uh, you know, PCs and Macs, obviously, whatever you have. So that's actually kind of cool. So it's like like a like um, Black Mesa, which is a Half Life game, is a PC only game, but you could play it on an Android device because mm -hmm. it's streaming from the cloud. That's actually it's kind of cool. Uh, so I've, anyway, I'll be a value. I'll I'll review this thing soon. But it's five. It's for I think it's five or six dollars a month. So. Um, you know, it's not as expensive as the other streaming services, but the other streaming services typically have giant libraries of games and you get those games from them. In this case, it works with whatever you have instead. It's That's interesting. That's nice. That part's really nice. Because, yeah. yeah, I've got uh, the Luna controller here, which yeah. pairs with yeah, yeah. Amazon's Luna service. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I'm not a, not, I wouldn't call myself a gamer at all, but mm -hmm. I found the, the idea of game streaming fascinating. And I also, uh, given that, Amazon's developers worked closely with the WebKit developers, the, uh, yeah. the Safari developers. I wanted to see sort of how that system worked. And one of the clever things about these is that you can set this up two ways. And I'm sure that it works with many of the systems like this. You can either mm -hmm. Bluetooth connect it directly to the device or, right. uh, and the way that I have it set up is this is independently connected to my Wi-Fi network. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That means that I can go from one system, I could be on my Mac uh, with the Amazon Luna client and then go to my iPad by going to luna.amazon.com browser. you don't browser. have to reconfigure the controller don't have to work. have to reconfigure. Yeah, yeah. I, that's just so, so smart. That's that's actually fairly unique. Stadia does something similar um, and that's about it. So like um, when I look at these things, like native controller support is one thing and that's what you're talking about. That's excellent. And then I think all of them actually also support a um, like an Xbox or a PlayStation controller, mm -hmm. and you can hardwire it in if it has that. You could uh, Bluetooth it, like you said, if you, if that's what you have. Um, yeah, there's different choices, but you obviously want the lowest latency choice. And if you have a native controller and it has that kind of connection to the cloud, that's probably going to be the best choice. Yeah. Uh, and with Amazon's Luna, I don't know, again, if others do this, but they've got uh, the ability to connect with Ubisoft, like a subscription to Ubisoft Plus. Mm -hmm. So you can play Ubisoft games, or is it Ubisoft? I don't know. Um, games <laughs> yeah. on your system, including Far Cry yep. and uh, other ones that people probably know of, Assassin's Creed, etc. Yep. Monopoly Plus, that sounds boring. <laughs> uh, I think Assassin's Creed would be the biggest one there. <laughs> and then, Far, well, Far Cry games are really big too, actually, yeah. Crisis Mary Jo is perked up at Monopoly, there. so maybe that one's the biggest. <laughs> Nico looking like he knows about gaming. I could do this if I wanted. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I was trying. Well, but I, I don't. Trying. <laughs> maybe, but yeah. maybe you do. No, I don't. <laughs> She's, no. Yeah. Um, no. Let us let us uh, move on then to our tips and picks. Up first, the tip of the week. Yeah, so I was just talking about my expectation that Microsoft is going to replace Skype with Teams. But here's a new Skype feature. It's called <laughs> uh, Meet Now, and it's built into the latest version of Windows 10. I've only seen it on one computer so far. I, I was uh, wondering what this was, Paul. So you've helped me. In my toolbar at the bottom is a button that says oh, Meet Now when I hover oh, over it. Yeah. yeah. You're one of the I've people I've only seen have. it on one computer. Um, so Microsoft, it, it's a, it's, I'll call this a Skype feature. It's called Meet Now. It's specifically designed for the pandemic when you think about it. And it's sort of related to the thing we were talking about before with Microsoft Teams where you don't have to sign up for anything. You don't have to download anything but you can have meetings online with other, you know, in this case with up to 99 people. Um, obviously, if you have a Skype account, it will just integrate with that. 
Um, if you don't, you can just go to Skype.com and there's a there's a meet now link that you get from the website that will let you do it from the web. That's, that's cool. You don't have to do anything. Just sign up, put in people's email addresses. You can connect with them. It's nice. Mm -hmm. If you have the latest version of Windows 10, well, presumably, like I said, I only, <laughs> I only see this on mm -hmm. one computer. It's a little strange. But uh, you might see this little icon down in the uh, taskbar. And that will give you that meet now capability where right from that icon uh, you can uh, communicate with other people. Um, can I make an observation that. on this, yeah. by the way? Mm -hmm. You know what's interesting about meet now? It doesn't have the word Skype in it. I was, yes. yeah, I had yes. no idea this was yes. Skype because of that. I thought, oh, right. is this Google Meet? I honestly thought <laughs> somehow <laughs> Google Meet had installed on my computer. Yeah. Yeah, the only reason and we it's, know it's It's Skype. hidden. It's hidden that it's Skype. Like even in their blog post about it, like you have to read way down into it to see the word Skype. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, this is kind of random. I'm on the Skype page looking at the Meet Now, the Skype yeah. site looking at the Meet Now page, and I, it literally found coupons related to Skype because I'm using Edge. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, They heard they, that you love that coupon feature Slip, so much. Like, They're like, let's, let's give him some coupons. <laughs> anyway, that's when he's going to um, create a meet to share all of his uh, <laughs> Skype coupons. <laughs> yeah. if, you don't want it, if you don't want the meet now icon there, uh, just right click on it. And uh, I don't know, remember what it says anymore, but it's either hide or remove or quit or whatever. Oh, but you can you get no. Um, it, just, it just says hide. Mm -hmm. There you go. And that's not now, if you want to bring it back, um, you have to go into the, win the, oops, the Windows 10 settings app. And that's going to be. Personalization task, no, personalization, yeah, personalization taskbar. And then there's a section in there, a link in there that says select which icons appear in the taskbar. And okay. you will see a meet uh, item in that list and you can turn it on again if you want to bring it back. But I will probably never mention that ever again because why on earth would you <laughs> want to bring this back? <laughs> Aha, I see. Yes, um, there's the option. Now, normally this is where we would do the app pick of the week, but I got ahead of myself. I got to tell you about bandwidth and then we'll come back with the app pick of the week. So, mm -hmm. folks, uh, this, of course, the 700th episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by bandwidth. Moving to Microsoft Teams can be complicated. We just talked about it a little bit earlier today. Bandwidth's duet for Microsoft Teams empowers you with software-driven SIP dynamic E911 and industry-leading expertise to simplify your move. Bandwidth Duet for Teams provides accurate 911 caller information for Microsoft Teams users while maintaining compliance with complicated E911 regulations during your migration so all your bases are covered. See, folks are wanting to make that migration, make that move, and you might think it's as simple as just you know, popping on over. But when you have these regulations in place, that is where you you kind of have a, a holdout on being able to make that switch. So that's where Bandwidth Duet comes in. You can solve for your advanced E911 needs, capturing precise location information at call time. Uh, Duet leverages dynamic location capabilities within Microsoft Teams to identify a user's location at the time of the call, and it natively routes those 911 calls across bandwidth's secure, geographically redundant, highly reliable, and nationwide network to solve compliance concerns and ensure employee safety. If your organization is considering direct routing, well, you can simplify these migrations with Bandwidth Duet from Microsoft Teams because it gives you greater control and value by helping you decouple all of your systems from Teams. You get the advantage of working directly with a cloud-native carrier, including failover control, call forwarding, and real-time reroutes all on the Microsoft Teams platform. So with Duet for Teams, you can save 40% compared to Microsoft calling plans. Ray Baum's Act uh, requires a dispatchable location. So the street address plus additional data like floor, suite, and room. And that is how this can help you. Uh, with Bandwidth's unlimited 933 testing capabilities, you can verify that your location information meets compliance standards without burdening public safety with live 911 calls. You'll have a migration partner, not just a provider. And you're going to get a dedicated onboarding specialist. This is awesome to help you execute your protect plan. A 24-7 NOC and expert support teams who will accelerate your migration and be with you every step of the way. Bandwidth provides great support, but they prove it. 
by being the easiest to work with. Their white glove customer support touts a 9.8 customer satisfaction rating and is uniquely positioned to help your enterprise migrate with less frustration while meeting regulatory expectations. Simplify telecom migrations and solve for regulatory requirements with a single cloud-native carrier. Bandwidth Duet for Microsoft Teams. Request your proof of concept at bandwidth.com slash WW. That's bandwidth.com slash WW. Thank you, Bandwidth, for your support of Twit and of this episode of Windows Weekly. All right. Tell me about the app pick of the week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, as most people know, there are a lot of Chromium-based browsers out in the world now. And we often talk about Chrome, obviously, but also, you know, Edge and Opera. But um, one of the other ones <laughs> is uh, Vivaldi. And this is an interesting company. It was started by a former executive from Opera. And one of the dreams that he had was to bring this integrated mail and calendar client from Opera that they got rid of years ago and make it available again in a web browser. And they're, they've just released the first technical preview of that. Uh, there's also a feed reader. So in addition to all the web browsing stuff and the unique features that Vivaldi has, um, it now has an integrated uh, mail calendar and, well, I should say integrated mail calendar and feed reader components, which... You know, I'm old, so this reminds me of Next Netscape Communicator. Remember back in the day, mm -hmm. they used to have the all-in-one, you know, they were actually separate apps, but it was kind of like this browser suite. Um, but these guys are doing it all through the same uh, application. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, you should check it out. It's actually, it looks surprisingly full-featured. And the blog post, that, which was written by this uh, person, whose name I, of course, forget because I'm old. Um, <laughs> but the <laughs> look it up. Uh, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this correctly, but John Von Tetschner, I don't, geez, it's quite a name, um, is incredibly detailed. It goes, it goes into great detail about each of these components and all the various features and so forth. Um, so it looks interesting. I mean, if you, it's, uh, it, this browser should give you all of the, you know, the stuff that you love from whatever Chromium based browser, but it has its own unique stuff. And now this is, this is kind of a big differentiator all of a sudden. All right. Um, and then the uh, Mary Jo Foley, it's time for your enterprise pick of the week. So this is an enterprise pick that's not directly about Microsoft, but I think it's still very interesting. Um, today, there is a rumor that began in the Wall Street Journal that Salesforce might buy Slack. Um, they said there have been talks, you know, and when you hear that, it could just be companies doing due diligence. It also could be people who want to see Slack's price go up, its market value, kind of circulating that rumor right before a holiday. It's been done. I'm, I'm not pointing fingers, but that happens. Um, but here's what's interesting about this. In the journal story, it says Slack's market value is $17 billion. So Slack, as uh, Windows Weekly listeners may recall, has been doing nothing but complaining about Microsoft, bringing antitrust case against Microsoft, saying Microsoft's competing unfairly. Uh, there was talk that at one point Microsoft might buy Slack, and then instead Microsoft mm -hmm. said, you know what, we don't need Slack, we can build Teams, and we've got the technology, we've got the know-how. So um, I think this, if this rumor does come true, it makes a lot of sense on a lot of different fronts. Salesforce has been on this acquisition kick lately and has been buying up a bunch of companies. And if they do buy Slack for $17 billion, this would be their biggest acquisition to date. They, they have a lot of things in common, you know, both based out in the Valley, both having CEOs who absolutely hate Microsoft. Yeah, I was going to say, like that's the biggest thing. <laughs> about it. That's a big one. Um, yep. And, you know, Salesforce and Microsoft compete on a lot of different fronts, um, especially in the whole CRM space. And I think it would be some nice synergies for Salesforce if they had a group collaboration platform, because look at what Microsoft's doing with Teams as far as extending it to be the everything hub. They Salesforce would have the money to do that with Slack. Um, the interesting things I, I've seen a couple of people point out on Twitter today is this sent Slack's price through the roof today and it tanked Salesforce's stock price today. What? So not, 
everybody thinks this is a great idea. <laughs> um, I've seen yeah, people speculating. See, like, Slack go has to go somewhere, don't they? I mean, don't you? They don't do. you? Amazon, they Google, do. Salesforce. Somebody's right. got to buy Slack. It Somebody seems like that has to happen. Yeah, I agree. Because they can't compete by themselves against Teams. They say Teams is their foremost right. competitor, and they just don't have the deep pockets that Microsoft has to do yep. what Microsoft's doing with Teams. Um, mm -hmm. So I do think somebody has to buy them. I don't necessarily think if Salesforce buys them that will push more Slack users to Teams, as I've seen some people speculating today. I, no. I don't I don't see that happening. Um, no. I think... There's, a, like I said, a lot of synergies corporate-wise, value-wise, just operations-wise with Slack and Salesforce that it might be a good fit and it might keep people who are using Slack in the fold. I mean, Salesforce might even pull a Microsoft and say, hey, we're going to just let Slack run themselves and kind of act like the independent company the way that Microsoft's done with GitHub and LinkedIn. So, yeah, yeah maybe, but be I, I sort of feel like Slack is such an also-ran at this point that being part yeah. of something bigger. I actually think uh, Google probably has already duplicated too much of it for this to make sense, but bringing yeah. it into yeah. Google workspace, whatever they call it these days, mm -hmm. kind of makes mm -hmm. the most sense because then the number of users yeah. just using Slack doesn't matter. It's about this broader True. user base. It's it's a feature of that thing, just like Teams is of Microsoft yeah. 365. I kind of thought Amazon would be a likely buyer. Amazon would be one too. Yep. yep. You know? I hope not though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. But. You know, you know, we talked about Microsoft wants to get consumers and more consumer customers because they have the enterprise. Amazon wants to get more business customers, right? Because right. they've got the consumers, mm -hmm. but they want the business users and they just don't have something that's similar to Office that's a credible offering. So they need to build that, that platform out. They've got Chime, yep. whatever the heck that thing is. Chime. Um, but yes. Would everyone using Chime please raise their hand? <laughs> Go ahead and Could chime, chime in, in now. In. <laughs> the only Chime yeah. you're going to hear is a cricket's leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But but I think it's interesting. So Slack's definitely in play, and um, it'll be interesting who ends up buying them and what the impact yeah. is, if anything, on Teams. I don't see them mean to be being independent. I just don't think that's I the don't future. either. Yeah. They don't want to be, I don't think. I, I don't think they've wanted to be for a while. I just so. don't want them to foie gras like Microsoft is doing with uh, with <laughs> Teams. Well, okay. I mean, look, the, 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 the range of possibilities there are horrific to contemplate. But what if they ended up yeah. at Oracle? I know. Who? You know? JK. Oracle, yeah, exactly. You know, the owner of TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Bite dance by Slack. Oh boy, right. you heard it here first. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we'll find out. But yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully that made sense. Swag is the one where they overfeed, right? And then it's all. Right. Yeah, I, I feel like that's SharePointify, but that that's kind of a weird thing to say too. Yeah, it's all weird. <laughs> team, yeah, yeah you, you don't want them to team teamify it. Teamsify. teamify. Teamsify, yeah. that's what it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I like the uh, foie, foie gras is that what you said? That's yeah, like, foie gras. <laughs> Just overstuffed. And some people yeah. find it delightful, but some of us are like, that's cruel. Yes, anyway. Many people are against it. Have so. you met yes, a goose? Maybe. Come on. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. Geese are pretty mean. Um, are the I'm, dicks of the animal world. I mean, come on. <laughs> I knew a goose or two growing up that uh, <laughs> was just not not fun to be around. Um, you know, some people but, think Stuart Butterfield is kind of mean. I don't know. Like, you know, maybe the maybe the metaphor Foie worked. Gras. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. There it is. You know that uh, what's our code name pick of the week? <laughs> okay, this is a fun one. Back to the vault. Utopia is the code name. Utopia was the code name for Microsoft Bob. Um and the reason Microsoft Bob is in the news this week, a few people have forwarded this to me. Um, there's a YouTube video up right now. Um, I'm trying to think whose channel this is. Dave's Garage is the channel. They've got a guy who was maybe the main coder, if not one of the main coders on Microsoft Bob, talking about, quote, the secret history of Microsoft Bob. Uh, his oh. name is Dave Plummer. And he it's a little 10 minute video on YouTube. It talks about some of the things you may or may not know about good old Microsoft Bob, like why it was a failure. The fact that the marketing manager on Microsoft Bob was Melinda French. And if you don't know who that is, that's Bill yeah. Gates's wife. Um, 
And even the Comic Sans was created for Microsoft Bob. I don't know if that's really <gasps> true, but is it true? What? <laughs> Um, so. So, yeah, I've got some research fun, to do because that's fun, interesting. Weird tidbits um, worth your oh. ten minutes if if you want to go back and remember Bob. And if you if you're too young to remember Microsoft Bob, it's kind of like The Sims in a program with a dog and yes. like a family. Yeah, I, no, I actually do remember micro. When, I didn't know that's what it was called, but when I was yeah. going through the Google images, I remember yeah. uh, turning on or switching to Microsoft Bob because what I used to do is uh, I had a, we had a really old computer and it ran Windows 98 and I installed Windows XP on it and it just barely worked. And so <laughs> at the time, my logic was, well, what if I install an even older version of Windows on it? Yeah. Then maybe maybe it'll go fast. And then I remember coming across Microsoft Bob. And at the time I had not started studying any graphic design stuff yet. So I wasn't put off by Comic Sans. So I, I definitely <laughs> paid attention to it I mean, and liked it at the time. It was, yeah. I mean, the precursor to, so if, if you guys are familiar with that general magic OS where it had kind of yeah. graphical desk with things on it, it was that kind of a UI. They had it different was. rooms, you know, in cartoons, yeah, but you go to the really cartoons. the predecessor to Clippy and to the dig whatever that little thing, the little dog that was in Windows XP and yeah. uh, arguably to the personal assistants, you know, that we have uh, today. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's it was that yeah. kind of thing. It was supposed to. It's, this is, this is funny. At the end it's, of his explanation of this, he says the TLDR is Bob was used to see the pseudo random encrypted digital ballast used to fill some of the unused space on the CDs for copyright protection purposes. Oh, <laughs> so who knows? Uh, I don't know how much of this so is parody. I, I, this might be wrong, but I have a memory that this thing came out right before Windows 95 and was in oh. fact designed to run on Windows 3.1. Oh, Does I thought it was right? designed to run on 95, no? I thought it was 3.1, but I... Was it? Yeah. I remember oh, getting the CD and like, trying it out and being like, what is this weird thing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, cause I know it was windows 95 that I installed to get yeah. it working. Um, I do want to confirm though, Mary Jo fonts.com did an interview with, um, Vincent Conair, the person who designed comic sans and, uh, the first yeah. question why, <laughs> uh, and it yes. says I designed comic sans while I was working at Microsoft. I had been given a beta version of Microsoft, Bob, a comic software oh. package. Wow. The package featured a dog called Rover and the balloon, yeah were for some reason in Times New Roman, which of course did not suit the comic context. Ah, so it's true. Yep. So and actually, so the stupid the, the stupid dog from XP was in fact <laughs> the same dog that was in Bob. Rover was Rover. also in XP. Yeah, same oh. dog. Oh. Huh. Well there you go. I liked Rover. I wasn't against Rover. He was cute. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with Rover, just the rest of it. <laughs> I like that it, that utopia was what it was called, as if that was some yeah. sort of yeah. that should have been dystopia, sure. but you know, anyway. It's the future <laughs> of computing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, all that is left is the I mean cocktail pick of the week. Although before you do your cocktail pick of the week, I do want to I, I came prepared this time. Um, okay. I believe last time I was on, I talked about how I could not find a uh, like the gluten free beer that I had found was OK, but not great. And the thing that I missed most was having coffee stouts. Um, mm -hmm. Glutenberg which is a Canadian beer company, makes a coffee stout that is actually not terrible. It is, wow. and I, I yeah. won't go as far as to say it is up to the level of the coffee stouts I once enjoyed, but yeah. given that it is a millet and buckwheat beer, it's actually quite good. Um, wow. And so I've finally been able to have coffee stout That's again awesome. nice. by way of Glutenberg. Nice. That's is it real name. coffee in it too or no? Uh, yes. Yeah. It's um, water, millet, buckwheat, hops, coffee, cocoa nibs, and yeast. Mm. Made That's in decent. Montreal. Mm -hmm. Nice. Glad you found that. Me too. Made me happy. Yeah. Yep. Now tell us about this cocktail. Yes. Yeah. So this one again. Oh, sorry. This, <laughs> sorry. this is Paul. This one again yep. comes from my wife. Um, not me. Yep. She makes the cocktails. But um, – this time of year, she has a lot with uh, cider and or cranberry juice, sometimes together, sometimes not. Different alcohols, like lots of uh, bourbon and, and whiskey-based drinks. So uh, before the show, I asked her if she had some kind of a, a Thanksgiving-themed 
uh, cocktail that she thought would be appropriate. And this one is actually one she created last year. And uh, what is this? It's called the Thanks <laughs> Thanksgiving Cranberry mm -hmm. Cider Sipper. We usually mm -hmm. go for shorter names, but we couldn't come up with a good one for this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, four parts dark rum and dark, like good rum, not like spiced rum, right? Uh, two parts apple cider, two parts cranberry juice, and one part lemon juice. Mm -hmm. Shake it all together over ice, uh, serve over ice, and uh, garnish with frozen cranberries. <gasps> um, mm. I, got a, I got a tip for anyone making cocktails. This is an incredible tip. And maybe it's one of those things that's like obvious, but we just figured this out, well, with the help of a bartender actually, but... Um, you ever go to a, a bar and you get a really good cocktail and it has like these little ice shavings like floating in the top? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like the yeah. I, I don't know what you call that. We've never been ice able shavings. to figure this out. Yeah, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, it's like <laughs> are they literally shaving ice into the top of it? Like how does how do they how do you do this? Mm -hmm. So we went. Uh, this is weeks ago now, but we went to a restaurant. The bartender brought over these incredible cocktails, and I said, I got to ask you, uh, how did you do this? And when you make a, a cocktail in a shaker, you know, you shake it. She said, you literally overfill it with ice. You, it has to be as full as possible. And you have to shake it until it hurts your hand to hold the thing anymore. And so you end up with a lot less drink in it because it's so full of ice. But that's mm -hmm. what makes that shaving stuff on the top. So it's just broken and, pieces uh, of ice. Yeah. And it's ah. seriously, it puts, it puts cocktails over the top. Like it's amazing. Huh. Some All of you right. are probably like, yeah, that, uh, Paul, that's obvious. But we, we <laughs> literally didn't know this. <laughs> now, I have a question about this recipe. The apple cider, mm -hmm. is this a boozy apple cider or normal apple cider? <laughs> normal. Normal okay. apple cider. Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is what makes it kind of a Thanksgiving drink because I guess you could get apple cider at any time of the year. But around this time of year, you know, there's a lot of it. And in this, where I live in Pennsylvania, there's uh, a lot of, <laughs> like a lot of local mm -hmm. apple ciders. So we kind of stock up on this stuff. Um and it's, yeah, it's a normal, like a good apple cider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love a good, not only tart, but there's like a, a sort of spiciness Zing. to it. There's almost yeah. an alcohol-like nature to apple cider, there isn't is. there? Like a fermentation Yeah, it has like a throat kind of burn a little bit, yeah. just a tiny yeah. bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the frozen cranberry garnish, that takes it right over the top. That's brilliant. Yeah. I'll definitely be making this. I um, yeah. like to make my, I play around with different things and I like to make my partner different uh, cocktails because I don't do a whole oh, lot of so drinking. So this one I'll have to try. I'm reminded that uh, you don't eat the cranberry, right? Cranberries are gross. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, one thing we do do a lot and you could substitute that here is we have cherries and that we, we uh, kind of store the cherries in moonshine that we get locally. <gasps> so it's like, 50% whatever the juice is from the cranberries and 50% of moonshine. So they become like these alcoholic little balls <laughs> you know, <laughs> of danger. When, yeah. When, yeah. When you take them out, it's, it's interesting because they're kind of dripping. It's, it's almost like a, not like a sauce, but like a, mm. it's kind of a viscous nature to it. So yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Juice. And it gives you like kind of a red, it just gives you a nice effect mm. in the glass too. Plus oh, you can yeah. eat the cherry and it's awesome. So mm. sort of like one of those, what are those called? The, uh, it's a tequila drink, tequila sunrise where it, it mm -hmm. kind of blends in with the yeah, yellow exactly. orange. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's you know, like those, uh, remember you, when you were a kid, you go get an ice cream from the truck and it had that uh, ball of um, gum in the bottom. Yep. <laughs> it, yeah. That would be like yeah. the treat at the end. It's yeah, like that. It's like bled bright into... blue, like neon yeah. blue. Or yeah, something. exactly. Your lips would turn blue <laughs> afterward. And great mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, folks, I think that brings us to the end of another episode of Windows Weekly, the 700th episode. My goodness. Uh, you, does that make you, does that make the show it's still younger than, um, than Rover's first introduction on Windows? But, uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Right. Certainly. I've right. been around for a while. Yeah. If you do the math on this, if you figure we do two hours, we often do more than two, but let's say we do two hours. I mean, if you, do, if you listen to the show for 24 hours a day, it's like f over 58 days. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty incredible. Right? Oh, wow. That's yeah. Crazy. Somebody will do this now that you've thrown down the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> yeah. listen, what could be better than listening to our voices for 58 days in a row? Exactly. You'll be, uh, <laughs> if you thought the pandemic You'll need some was of terrible those sippers, already. Those cranberry sippers yeah. to get them. Yeah. <laughs> G -g gather a few of those. Um, <laughs> Mary Jo Foley of All About Microsoft, thank you very much. Thank you. And Paul Therott of Therott.com. Thank you, sir. And thank you. 
Always good to yeah. see you, man. Glad to, yes. glad to have you back. Happy to be here today. And of course, Thank if you, you want well. to tune in live to the show uh, to watch as everything happens and uh, question Paul on his math and uh, watch Mary Please. Jo chuckle while he Always talks about Microsoft, uh, yes. you can tune in <laughs> Wednesdays at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1900 UTC. But of course, the best way to get the show is by subscribing twit.tv slash WW, where you can go to subscribe to the show in its various formats of an audio and video on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, all the podcast places. Uh, and we do thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, of course, Leo will be back next episode, but uh, thanks for having me on today and goodbye. I'm Jason Howell, host of Tech News Weekly here on Twit.tv, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Each and every week, we talk to people who are making and breaking the tech news. It could be journalists writing amazing tech stories. It could be experts. It could be the sources of the stories themselves, developers, you name it. We bring them onto the show, and we talk to them about why their story is resonating with the world. You can watch and subscribe by going to Twit.tv slash TNW. Make sure you do that. And you won't miss a single episode. We'll see you there.